Welcome back to my channel, Sierra Tango 641. I uh, had some requests to do a tutorial on how we make our homemade sugar cane syrup that we've been cooking here in South Georgia. And uh, I'm going to walk you through kind of the step-by-step -step process this year and kind of show you what we do. I'll, uh, I'll start by telling you a little bit about sugar cane. Um, got a couple of stalks here. It's in the grass family. I honestly can't tell you the technical uh, name of our particular variety of cane from what I've been able to research it's kind of what they consider an old North Florida or South Georgia green cane uh, but it's uh, it's really really hard to chew on but it makes really really sweet syrup um, the planting process as you can see the patch behind me uh, it pretty much grows back longer and thicker every year uh, as you'll note right here at all of these joints you can see where there's new stalks beginning to grow off of this one stalk. So you plant one stalk, next year you may have three stalks, and next year you may have six or eight or nine stalks. It just grows and grows and grows uh, to the extent that sometimes you have to, to trim it back. Uh, the first step that we're going to show you today is how we strip the cane. We can't take the cane and begin processing the sugar and the syrup part until we get all of this, what we call fodder, stripped off the cane. And as you can see in the patch behind me, there is a lot of fodder that has to be stripped off. Uh, I'm sorry that the patch is so crooked. We can thank Hurricane Idea of 2023 for messing that up for us. So it's going to be some work this year, but uh, we're going to show you how to get it done. The first step in this harvesting process is, as I said, we have to strip that fodder off the cane. We do that by using this very technical and sophisticated tool we call a stripper. This particular stripper has been in my family for who knows how long, but it's basically just spring metal cut on an angle, put it on the stalk, and you strip down. And you strip every stalk in the entire patch. It gets to be a pretty big pile of this fodder stripped off. Later on, when the season's over, we'll use it to cover up the stubbles and keep the beds from freezing during the winter. Mostly throughout the year, Daddy's retired, so he gets to sit here and watch it grow and water it and fertilize it uh, while the rest of us have real jobs and work. So he claims he does the hardest part, tending to it all year. But as you can see, it's just me and Maggie in the patch stripping today. That's the one thing you're allowed to skip school for is good, uh, stripping cane. Old hurricane made a pretty good mess of it. Knocking it over and putting it all on top of one another. You could drive the truck between these two rows. That's what a hurricane will do to your cane patch. Makes it a little bit aggravating to handle. Definitely aggravate the feed through the mill. When I was a kid, we used to strip it all, top it all, cut it all, load it all, haul it all to barn, and then it may sit on the trailer for two, three weeks while we cooked, you know, one at a time here, there, and yonder. So the last couple of cookings, that cane had been cut down for two or three weeks. We started 
finding out well that was causing us some problems so we've kind of changed and went back to just stripping and topping and cutting only what we need to cook that particular day which uh, makes it a guessing game and I guess you could say a little bit more of a, a pain but uh, but it has seemed to cut down on a lot of our cooking issues now we have a machine that will cut most of this for us but because of the way the hurricane did us it's gonna be hard to get it in here and cut it off so some of this I'm having to cut by hand that's the way they did it in the old days you cut it a stalk at a time cut it at the bottom cut off the top lay it down as you can see right here you know those those are last year's stubbles these are stubbles I'm cutting right now and these that I'm cutting right now they'll be here next year when this is all grown back even thicker than it is now hopefully with less hurricanes and once you get it stripped then you get to cut all the tops out of it which is as simple as People sometimes ask us why we put the burner on the left side of the kettle as opposed to right under the center. Well, there is a reason for that, and I'll show you why in an upcoming video. Over the years, we've kind of progressed. We like to put the temperature in that. So I'll let it get up to about 170, 180 degrees. Get a lot of that sediment off the bottom, rise to the top before we start skimming. We're sitting at about 86 right now. We're about 100 degrees now. We lit the fire at 925. It's gone. 
50. Seven, we'll start skipping. Let's start the heat on up. Have it to 50 degrees. 10 minutes after 10. One seven four. That's the start of the school. Got to take a moment to shout out to my son Tyson. He's 16 years old, and he can do it with the best of them. You don't find many 16-year-olds that are even interested in this art anymore. Is that a microphone on top of it? Mm -hmm. so, so, hey. So, boop. <laughs> And this is why we put the burner on the left side of the kettle, because it heats the left side quicker than it does the right side, which causes all of the skimmings to roll across over to Tyson so he don't have to chase it. Makes it a lot less work on a man doing a skimming. Okay, so you're probably wondering what I'm doing with the water hose there. Once that juice reaches 212 degrees, it's boiling. As you can see, we still have a lot of skimmings in the kettle. Tyson still got a lot of work to do, so we don't need it to boil yet. If you're having trouble with dark syrup and you don't have a dark, dark cane, reason is you probably aren't skimming it as good as you should be. So what we'll do, and actually what I'm doing right here, I'm just showing the different skimmers that we use. Uh, but as you can see, Tyson is still uh, working. So what we'll do is we'll get it to about 209, 210 degrees, almost to a boil, but not quite there. And then we'll hit it and shock it with some cold water. Not a lot. We'll just put the hose in there, hit it a little bit. It accomplishes two things. One, it slows the boil back down. Two, whatever uh, skimmings may still be clinging to the bottom of the kettle, they'll come loose and come to the surface. Uh, if you keep watching Tyson skim right here, you'll watch those skimmings, which are still fairly green, eventually go to more of a tan or white colored. And I just eyeball it. And, and when he gets that thick stuff out and that thick stuff stops coming up and it starts turning more white like you see right there, I know, okay, it's about time to rock and roll and we'll go ahead and cut the heat to it. Uh, now, Tyson's about done skimming the big stuff. So now we're fixing to put the ring on it so that we can have more room to boil it harder. We're cutting the fire to it hard now. Now it's 212 degrees. It's, it's, it's as hot as it can get until it thickens up. And for the next two or three hours, it's going to sit here and boil 212, 214, 216, 218, 220. To, we pull it out at about 223 as it uh, gets thicker and thicker. But you can see it's already starting to lighten up and whiten up because Tyson skimmed most all of it out before we ever got it boiling in the first place. If you get it to this point right here and you have not finished skimming the thick stuff, uh, you're going to be in a bad way. Now, obviously, we're still going to have some come up, and it's going to go over the side, and we're going to you know, fine-tune it as we go. You don't get it all out. But uh, you want to get all of that thick stuff before you ever get it to a boil. That's how you accomplish having clear, you know, not-so-dark syrup. We're just slowly bringing the heat to it and getting it up.
little hand skimmers that you see there have a wire mesh welded into them it's kind of like a small strainer and they just keep pushing that green stuff around there towards Tyson the heat keeps rolling it over there to him the ball keeps it coming up over the edge and you just keep skimming wiping with a rag wiping with a sponge just getting all that green out you do this the better judge of where it's at you'll be little things like the color and the size of the bubbles even the smell you can see right there it's went from green to white to tan almost that syrup color uh, the bubbles went from great big to real small uh, you bite to see it'll start hopping and jumping there and the thicker and hotter it gets the more it'll do that uh, it's getting close to about 216 degrees right now so we well over the 212 bowl that we started at uh, the foam that's left there, that's white foam. There ain't much green left in that. Tyson did a really good job of cleaning that stuff out and getting it clean. Uh, our kettle, for instance, is an 80 gallon kettle. So we start with 80 gallons of juice. We'll end up with about 10 gallons of syrup. Uh, so the longer it boils, you're boiling all that water out of it. So by the end, there ain't much left in it. As you'll see my battery's about to die and I, I lose uh, a critical part of it. Sorry about that. But you can see in the kettle right there, there ain't much left in it. Uh, that's how you know it's getting getting close. When it starts falling, you're almost there. C6s, I can't see the number. C3 and a half. So when the syrup got 223 degrees, the bricks sacrometer read 63 and a half. For years and years, we would use a bomb hydrometer. But we figured out there was a big difference between 64 balm and 66 balm when it came to thickness and how much sugar would wind up being in it. Uh, we found it a little bit more precise when we went to a, a Brix sacrometer. Um, so again, the numbers were about 223 degrees at 63, 64 bricks is about where we like to have our syrup. Uh, and you heard me tell Tyson to cut the fire off. Now we're getting it out of the kettle as fast as possible. Uh, we kind of built this little rig here. We've got the top tub. We're just trying to get that syrup in it as fast as possible. We're not straining it. We're just dumping straight into it because the longer it sits in that kettle, uh, the hotter and thicker it's going to get. It's pouring out of that top tub into a bottom tub uh, that has all the strainers on it. So we're doing the straining once it pours out of that top tub. I'll try to get you a better view here in just a second. There you go. We're just getting it out. There's your candy on the side. Everybody likes to get them a little, little candy. Except for the poor guys doing all the work. They don't get to eat no candy. And if we're not cooking another round, we'll just put about... 10 gallons of water in it, let that water heat up. That's what we'll use to clean the kettle. If we're gonna cook another round, we'll just go ahead and start dumping juice in it. And now that the syrup has been strained, uh, we buy some industrial grade strainers and then we have a couple of layers of cheesecloth under that. So it, it takes it a pretty good while to get that 10 gallons of syrup strained through.
If you're having foam in the top of your bottles, let the syrup run down the edge of the glass like she was doing. And there you have it. Copeland cane syrup. Thank you for watching.